Okay. And all right. So last time we introduced complex numbers, we're going to talk um, a little bit more about them probably on Tuesday next week, but then we're kind of done. There's not a whole lot to say about complex numbers. They're extremely important. Um, today, we're going to get into this idea of what we call complex phasers, which are, which are extremely important. And it's really the reason why we use them is because of this relationship that exists between complex numbers and sinusoids. Okay, we talked about that a little bit on, on Tuesday. All right, so um, I guess I didn't update my first slide here, but, but on Tuesday we talked about um, complex number intro, right? Um, today we're gonna talk a little bit more about this idea about phasers and then a little bit of wrap up next week. And, and we'll talk next week about exam one. All right, so there will be more talk about that. Exam one, will be, again, I will give you sometime next week a practice exam that looks like the real exam, all right? It's just gonna be a PDF. There's no, there's no online submission of anything. The only online submission there will be is that you will scan a PDF and upload it, okay? So there's no, no messing with any of the computer um, during that time period. You don't need to have a camera on or any of that kind of stuff. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna trust, as I said on the very first day, I'm gonna trust that you're you're doing the right thing. If I find out that you're not, then we'll, we'll punish that to the fullest extent, but I'm gonna trust that you're doing the right thing, okay? Um, so in terms of the, the textbook material um, that we're, we're looking at here, um, <clears throat> in chapter four is where complex numbers are. We really covered 4.1, 4.2, and 4.3 on Tuesday. All right, so really the, the, the big items, and I, and I know that to some extent you're covering this a little bit in 2112, um, you know, so you've seen it there and you saw it in high school, that was a long time ago, but, but you're seeing it in two places at least right now, I think for a lot of you. Um, today, we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit more about 4.4 and 4.7, all right? 4.5 and 4.6 are, will be covered later. So those are the sections that are sort of relevant uh, to all of this, okay? So last time we talked about the fact that there is this key relationship between complex numbers and um, sinusoids, all right? And I said from the very first day that sinusoids and particularly sine waves are really important in all of our, our ECE problems because radio waves, uh, electromagnetic radiation of any sort is a sinusoidal waveform power waveforms are sinusoidal, audio waveforms are sinusoidal, most of the things that we process are sinusoidal, and even if they're not, usually they can somehow be viewed as the sum of many sine waves, okay? And we'll, and we'll deal with that concept a little bit more. And essentially we get this thing that we talked about at the end last time, which is Euler's identity, all right? And Euler's identity is basically what I've written out here. Now, the one difference of what I have right here is this guy has right now I as my imaginary number. I said for our, our ECE problems, what do we use instead of I? J. 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 All right. Yeah, one of the things that you'll find in, um, in MATLAB, all right, and I should note this, is that I and J are both predefined, all right? Both of them are. Um, as the square root of minus one. So they're both defined as the imaginary number. If you go along, one thing to remember, if you go along and say I equals zero and J equals you know, 10 or whatever, now all of a sudden you no longer have an imaginary number. All right, I've seen people do that before. So be careful of that, all right? Um, that's definitely an issue you can come across, all right? Anyway, so what we said is there's this relationship between complex numbers and sinusoids and we said that that comes up a lot in, in sort of real problems. And so today, I wanted to look at something I showed you on the very first day of the semester. And basically what this is, is a radio. And this, this specifically is something called software defined radio. So what I have, and I can't see what's here on the screen, but this guy here is a, what I call a software defined radio. And you can see hopefully that there's an antenna coming out of this guy right now, all right? So inside this is uh, basically a set of, of um, process, as a processor and a chip inside this thing. I'm gonna set it back down here. 
Um, and what I've got is a bunch of blocks that I've kind of pulled together um, to create a simple FM radio. And this is the same thing that we showed on the very first day of the semester. And what you see here, this guy right here is a block whose outputs are basically the outputs of the, of the chip coming off of this thing, right? So essentially it's the outputs coming off the USB port. And I wanted to take a quick look at that for a second. So if hopefully you guys can see this well enough. Um, so I built an FM radio and open this block up here real quick. So this guy is what's controlling the, the outputs of, of the chip on this thing. So I see a couple of things here. So it says that the channel zero frequency, 104.7 e to the six. So that means I'm tuned to 104.7 megahertz, okay? And I have a sample rate here, it says SAMP rate. SAMP rate's a variable, which is defined as 20 megahertz. So let me, guys, let me ask you guys this. If I say I have a sample rate of 20 megahertz, We'll talk about that idea later in the semester, but it, let's see if anybody knows. What, when I say I have a sample rate of 20 megahertz, what does that mean? Anybody know? Six uh, a sample at uh, once, or sorry, two, uh, 20 million times a second. 20 million times a second. In other words, the output of this chip here, this thing here called Osmocom source, basically there is an output coming from it 20 million times a second. And if you look at this here, what's the data type? coming out of this thing at 20 million times a second. This is the data type here, right? It's, it's a float. It's a float. It? And in particular, it's not just a float, but it says- It's a uh, complex. It's a complex float, all right? Which actually means that I get uh, two numbers coming out of that, two floating point numbers. You guys have taken C or C++ or whatever it is these days. Right, and so you know what a floating point number is, and basically I'm getting two floating point numbers, one part's real, one part's imaginary. So in other words, what's coming out of this radio, all right, is actually imaginary numbers, complex numbers, right? Or these complex samples, all right, which is, so these things are, are real things that we deal with on a regular basis. And let me ask you this, if this guy is a radio, what kind of waveforms did I say I have when I look at radio waves? Sinusoidal. Sinusoidal, right? Sinusoidal. And so I got complex numbers that are representing somehow sine waves. And so we want to start to understand what that relationship is. So what I'm going to do here real quick is I'm going to run this guy and I don't know what I'm going to get when I do that. Work and learn from anywhere. A commercial apparently. There you go. All right, so right now this guy is playing the radio. He's tuned to this 104.7, whatever that is. Um, and what I see here is the FFT. I talked about this thing last time, the fast, fast Fourier transform. So basically this block right here is taking in the output of the radio and it's showing me what it sees. So this is something we talked about on the very first day, right, a little bit. What do you, what do you, what is this thing showing me here? Well, the, the X axis, and let me kill the, kill the audio there completely. All right, so if I look at what, I, what I've got here, um, if I look at what's going on here, what I see is the, I got frequencies here on the X axis, and I've got amplitudes here on the Y axis, all right? So what this is telling me I, somehow is I have complex numbers coming out of this chip. And yet somehow this thing here is telling me, looks like it's telling me the magnitude. Now it's telling me the magnitude in weird units, but it, it's telling me basically that I've got a signal. So I said I tuned this thing to 104.7. So let's see, where is that? That should be where? Probably somewhere around here hopefully somewhere around here, all right? Somewhere in this, in this area, all right? And there's, there's a couple of, there's they're basically different signals here um, that we can play around with to sort, of, to sort of see, right? But now I've got my, my different radio stations that I can sort of, sort of tune this thing through. And each one of these is basically represents another radio station. And each one of these represents essentially the amplitude of the signal at that particular frequency, all right? Let me try, I wanna run this guy, I'm gonna kill it here real quick. And 
say, well, I'm going to change this to a different station. 106.5 looked like it was a big one. All right, so I'm going to do that. And bring my volume back up here. And run this. Now it's not it's not tuning too particularly well to that guy, I guess. All right, I'd have to play around a little bit, but you guys get sort of the basic idea of what's going on here, right? This plot here, this FFT plot, somehow these amplitudes that we see in this plot are somehow related to the complex numbers that are coming out of the chip here, all right? So there's a clear relationship and we need to, we need to wanna uh, kind of understand that. We know that these radio waves are sinusoidal. And so we gotta figure out that relationship between those sinusoidal waveforms and these complex numbers because clearly there is one, okay? Um, let's stop there for a second. Any questions about that basic setup that anybody wants to ask? So in a nutshell, each of those peaks was a different uh, radio station. Each of we those peaks is, is a different radio station. That's right. And, and in fact, if I run that again real quick, and let me, let me go back to the one that was working. So 104, 104.7, like that. And this program's a little slow sometimes. All right, what you see is, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> so one thing I'll point out here is, is basically, <laughs> one of the things you'll see here, right, is that the, it looks like there's a little bit of dancing going on and in, in these, some of these guys are jumping up and down, right? Why, why do you think these amplitudes are jumping up and down like that? Anybody want to venture a guess? Is that the modulation that causes the actual variation in the signal to produce noise? Yeah, there's, so there's variation in the signal and it's not because, you know, Call Me Maybe was playing and it was a dance party, right? But what's the, uh, what's the real reason for that variation on an FM radio station? Um, well, on an FM radio station, the frequency is modulated. So that would mean that it would fluctuate on the frequency, right? Yeah. So basically what, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, but basically the frequency is kind of moving around a little bit. All right. Because it's being quote unquote modulated. So the, the, the song there is basically causing the frequency to dance around a little bit. So that's why you saw that variation. So we got some stuff to, to kind of learn to understand that, but clearly this stuff is, is useful. Okay. All right. Any other questions about that? All right, so let's, let's get into the, the meat of this here today. All right, so last time we basically learned here about Euler's identity, okay? And Euler's identity was this idea, which we've already talked about here today, that somehow there's a relationship between e to the j theta and then cosine theta plus j sine theta. And as I mentioned last time, basically what that means is you can, you can go in and you can, um, you can prove uh, this expression. You can prove that this is correct using something called a Taylor series expansion. If you want to understand that, if you look at section 4.4 .4 in the textbook, it shows you this relationship. We're going to try to intuitively prove it today, um, basically using some, some MATLAB examples to see that we can kind of intuitively make the relationships. And we can begin to understand really that the complex number is really just a notation that allows us to maybe ultimately simplify all of the math that we would have to do, right? One of the things we're going to see next time, next, next week, um, you guys have in your homework today or your homework currently problems like this, right? Which you have to do by integration by parts. One of the things that, you know, in my opinion, at least, as long as you don't have a computer doing this for you, if you do this by hand, this is probably one of the most annoying integrals that you can ever do. 
But you guys should have seen that in this particular case, for an integral like this, you actually end up having to do two integrals, right? You should know that by now if you've done problem one, right? This type of integral actually occurs quite a bit in a lot of the things that we do in electrical and computer engineering. This guy gets a lot simpler because of this, all right? So we're gonna ex begin to explore that a little bit over the next two lectures, but we gotta understand this Euler's identity first a little bit further, okay? All right, so a couple of things as we go into that, all right? I wanted to, to understand the basic concept before we explore Euler's identity a little bit further. And last time we ended with this, and this is very similar to the problem that I put into the, um, into the chat there. If I have, you know, Z1, Z2 like this, and I wanted to multiply them, all right? So let's say I have Z1 times Z2. All right, hopefully by now you guys have a pretty good sense. What's the magnitude of Z1 times Z2? 12. 12, all right. And what's the angle of it? Negative, Negative 45, 45 degrees. degrees. Yep, negative 45 degrees. All right, so this guy, multiplication is really easy to do when we're dealing with um, numbers in, in the complex exponential format, okay? And, and the reason I wanted to talk about this real quick is because when I look at essentially these vectors, let's draw out here where those vectors are. So 3e to the j45, that's gonna be over here somewhere, right? This is 45 degrees. Let's say instead of multiplying it by four e to four e to the minus j ninety, let's say instead that I multiplied it by e to the minus j ninety. Okay. What what happens if I do that? If I multiply three e to the j forty five degrees times e to the minus j ninety like that? It rotates ninety degrees clockwise. It rotates ninety degrees clockwise. That's right. It's a rotation, right? Anytime I do a multiplication by e to the minus j something, I do a rotation, right? And I rotate 90 degrees clockwise, right? So basically in this case, what I'm doing, because I had an angle of minus 90 degrees, is I rotate it clockwise like that. Now, let's try to remember, in, if we, when we talk about angles in, in any you know, plane, right? You learned about angles in, in high school, right? Which direction is positive angles and which direction is negative angles when we're rotating like this? Positive is uh, counterclockwise then? Yep, positive is always counterclockwise, right? If you think about it, right, zero degrees is here, 90 degrees is here, 180 degrees is here, right? So positive angles move in the counterclockwise direction, right? So if I multiply by e to the j negative 90, what happens is I end up shifting this guy or rotating it negative 90 degrees, all right, which means I move it back 90 degrees. Let's say instead that I had multiplied it by minus j 45 degrees. What would that do? It would become like a line, straight line on the x-axis. Yep, that guy would basically have the same length, but he'd be a straight line on the x-axis, right? I'd rotate it back 45 degrees. If I multiplied by e to the j 45 degrees, where would he be then? 90 degrees. Yep, 90 degrees. I'd rotate it forward 45 degrees. All right, so this is a, this is a kind of a key idea because this idea of, of the rotation comes in really importantly when we talk about the relationship between complex numbers and sinusoids, okay? So, so we're gonna exploit that a little bit as we go through today. Before I do, I wanted to basically try to determine some key relationships that come from Euler's identity. And these, these are in the book, um, and these are ones that we're gonna utilize pretty heavily, all right? So essentially what I've got here on the left side, the left side I've written out, um, what is the you know, basic Euler's identity? Okay. Um, one of the things I, I wrote out over here on the right side is what happens if I plug in e to the minus j 90 degree, or e, sorry, let me not pick a number. Let me just e to the minus j theta, right? So I have a negative angle. 
right? So if I did that, so I got to the answer over here, but what did I have to do to get to the answer that I wrote here, right? If I put a negative value in, that means I put a negative value into cosine. So I put a negative number, I put a negative theta in here and a negative theta in here, okay? So let me ask you guys this. If I have cosine of minus theta, what's that always equal to? I don't expect you to remember all your trig identities. Cosine theta? Yeah, it's, it's equal to cosine theta. And I, I don't expect you to remember all your trig identities, but that's, that's one trig identity that um, is pretty, pretty important, right? Um, sine of minus theta is equal to what? Negative, negative sine, sine theta. Yep, negative sine of theta, like that. Okay, and so what I did here is there's the final result between the two of them. All right, so if I plug in negative theta into Euler's identity, what I get is this guy over here. All right, doesn't necessarily off the right off the bat seem all that particularly important. All right, but it helps me a couple of ways. All right. So let's, let's see a couple of things that we can see from this. Let's say if I'm looking at these two expressions, let's say I said, what happens if I do e to the j theta plus e to the minus j theta, All right? Let's combine them like that. If I combine those like that, what's the result, All right? So I get cosine plus cosine, so I get two cosine. So you double the magnitude, but you totally remove the imaginary component. I totally removed the imaginary component, okay? So let's say I wrote this guy and I multiplied it by a half like that, okay? What's that do to this? Well, it gets rid of that part. So I see right off the bat that it looks to me like two complex exponentials, one with a positive angle and one with a negative angle equals cosine of theta, okay? Not necessarily the most impressive thing in the world, but it is important for us, right? Let's, let's say we then did something like this. Let's say instead of adding them, let's say I did e to the j theta, all right, plus, not plus, minus e to the minus j theta, like that, all right? What happens if I do that? So I subtract the two. So what happens to the cosine terms when I do the subtraction? Cosine goes away. The cosine goes away. All right. And you, you double the magnitude of it and have only the imaginary component. Yep, and you have only the imaginary component and you double its size. So this guy becomes 2j sine theta, okay? Now, <clears throat> Let's say I wanted to, to convert that to sine, right? How could I, how could I have this, uh, this right side over here become sine? What would it take to, to do that? What would I have to multiply both sides by to turn this guy into sine? Oh, would it be the cotangent? Boy, I, maybe that's possible, I don't know. But, but what would it, so if I've got 2j times sine theta here, what would it take to turn this? What would I have to multiply this by to turn this into just sine theta? Divide by one two over two j. Yeah, one over two j. Okay. Sorry, I misunderstood. No, no problem. Right. So I get that. Right. So this whole thing basically tells me that sine of theta equals that. Okay. So these two relationships are important to me. All right. We're going to use them quite a bit. And they, they are part of the reason why I know that there is this really, so, I, so, I, so if, I, if I have a, a radio waveform or whatever, I've just learned something really important here. I've learned that if I have a radio waveform that's of the form cosine omega t, where theta is equal to omega t, I can relate that somehow to two complex exponentials, okay? Same thing with sine, all right? We're gonna use that and exploit that here in a little bit. I see that there's probably two other important relationships here for me, which is that Let's say I had, oops, let's say I had um, cosine of theta is also equal to, how can I relate cosine 
directly to e to the j theta without doing this addition like I did. How else can I do it? How can I just look at this expression and make a direct relationship between e to the j theta and cosine theta? Would it just be e to the j theta minus j sine theta? Well, I could, yeah, I could do that, but let's, let's say that's, so yeah, that's one way to, to, to try to do it. But I want to say cosine theta is, I want to relate it directly without having the mm. sine in it. Couldn't I say it's also the real part of e to the j theta? In other words, when I say the real part, right, that's this part here. The imaginary part is the other term, right? So sine of theta is equal to the imaginary part of e to the j theta, like that. All right, so I've got three relationships, or four relationships, I guess, that explain to me how I can relate between an exponential, a complex exponential, and a sine or a cosine again doesn't seem all that particularly important except for the fact that as we find out it greatly simplifies a lot of the work that we have to do in all of these very common problems that we have like the radio problem I talked about right so in the radio problem clearly what this what this radio is spitting out here for us right what this guy is spitting out effectively is complex samples all right so in other words it's outputting something that has a real part and an imaginary part but clearly there's something valuable about it the thing that's really valuable about it ultimately, all right, is the fact that um, we have this relationship that exists between, between these two things that we can then utilize to greatly simplify the math that we do, okay? And we're gonna, we're gonna understand these relationships or try to understand them a little bit intuitively today and see that they make some sense. All right, so if, again, I said in, in our, cases, we usually are dealing with sine waves, meaning these guys vary as a function of time, which, which means then that I plug in for theta omega t plus phi, okay, omega t plus phi. So that means that this guy would basically be e to the j omega t plus phi or cosine of omega t plus phi plus j sine omega t plus phi, like that. All right. One, one way I can, I can also write this is sometimes I, I factor this guy. If I have e to the j omega t plus phi like that, all right, um, that looks like I have e to the j phi times e to the j omega t. All right, how did, I, how did I get from this expression here to this expression here? What did I do to go from, from the one on the left to the one on the right? When you multiply two exponents, they add. Yep, that's right, okay. When I multiply two exponentials, right, I add their exponents, all right? Now, I see in the chat there's a question there. Um, those formulas are, are closely related to the cinch and tanch, all right, the hyperbolic stuff. We're not going to touch those. Those are, those are not all that particularly useful for most of our problems. They're useful in some field stuff, but we're, we're, we're not really going to deal with that. But they are very closely related to those formulas, uh, for sure. Um, all right. So we're going to use this, because this is a much more common type of, of form, right? If I said to you that I had um, a complex number e to the j omega t, right? Let's think about that for a second. If I told you I had e to the j 30 degrees like that, how would I draw e to the j 30 degrees? How would I draw that in the complex plane? Well, it would be, you would go 30 degrees uh, counterclockwise yep. and then you draw a line out one length. Yep, so the length of this guy would be one and this angle would be 30 degrees, okay, like that. So, all right, we can make sense of e to the j 30 degrees. What happens if I have e to the j omega t here? How do I draw that? How would I sketch that? Uh, 
Any ideas? La so label the angle omega t. Yeah, I could. So so what does it what does it imply? If I say that my angle here is equal to omega t, what does that mean? If my angle is equal to omega t, and then it changes over time. It changes over time, right? So as time advances, this guy moves, right? And and as time advances, which way is that thing moving? Clockwise. Counterclockwise. Counterclockwise, right? Our angles always increase in in the positive direction. So as time advances from zero to one second to two seconds, whatever, right? My angle is always going to be advancing forward. Okay, so we're going to try to understand that a little bit here and try to make make some examples of this. All right. So, all right. What I want to do is I want to first take an example like this. Let's say I've got four cosine 1000 T plus 30 degrees. And I want to represent this two ways, right? First, first way I want to represent this guy is as a real part of something. And notice what I do, this is a standard math form. I use the squirrely or curly brackets there um, to denote the, the real of something, okay? MATLAB, and I talked about this last time, MATLAB has a function called real and imaginary, okay? MATLAB has functions real and imaginary. If I put in a, in a number like three plus J four, and this is in the code that I uploaded last time. If I put into MATLAB real of three plus J four, what do I get when I do that? Anybody know? Three. Three, and what do I get when I put in the imaginary part? Oops. Uh, four. Four. Four, yeah, that's important. I get four, I don't get J times four, right? I get four. All right, I get the imaginary part is the coefficient. That's the important thing. It's the coefficient of the J, okay? So what I wanna do is I wanna express this four cosine 1000 T plus 30 degrees two ways. One as the real part of something. And in another way, I wanna use those, this idea here. I wanna use this relationship here, all right? I want to use that relationship where I add, uh, add something with a positive angle and add something with a negative angle together. So let's do the real part thing first. So I would say that this is the real part of what? How should I start this? What does that look like it should be the real part of? So first of all, let's, let's, look, let's look at it this way. So I've got a cosine part. So that means I've got a real part of something. So let's write down the, the relationship I wanna know, right? So remember e to the j omega t plus phi. So we'll call this guy here theta. Yeah, it looks like it should be four e to the j thousand t plus thirty. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So so hang on to that thought for a second there. So just to let's rewrite this for ourselves here. All right. So if I have e to the j theta, I get cosine theta plus j sine theta. Okay. So. If I'm looking at this, if I have a cosine, if I told you I've got a cosine, that means I'm looking for a real part of some complex exponential, right? So how could I go, let's, let's think about this for a second. If I multiply both sides of this by four, right? I would have four, four, and then here I would have plus J four like that, right? So that tells me that I'm looking for the real part of four times What'd you say there, Philip? Uh, that was uh, four times e to the j times a thousand t plus thirty. Yep, and yeah, I could say e to the j again. So it says omega t plus thirty. So my frequency omega is a thousand t plus thirty degrees, right? Or the way that I typically simplify that is I'm going to say I got the real part of what? How can I, how can I write that? How, how can I um, 
expand this a little bit. I'm gonna, I don't, what I want to do is I want to separate the thousand T from the 30 degrees into two exponentials. How do I do that? Or you multiply it out into two separate E's. So yeah. four E to the J thousand T times E to the J 30. Yeah. And I wrote that the opposite way of what you just said, which I did that on purpose because I actually want to get those two guys together. Right. And so I, and I did that on purpose. These two guys here, I'm going to say that those things are static. What does it mean by saying that they're static? They're not Constantly. varying with time. They're not varying with time. All right. They're not varying with time. That's, that's important. All right. If I look at this part here, it is varying with time. Okay. This, this whole thing, all right, this entire thing, I'm going to call a, I'm going to call this thing a dynamic phaser. All right. I've got the full, I've got a definition of that more cleanly. All right. Um, and this thing here, this part here is the static phaser or more often just called the phaser. All right. Now you haven't dealt with that yet in circuits two, but you will. All right. Circuits two is going to be all about the use of what we just talked about, this idea of phasers. All right. And we're going to try to understand them a little bit more mathematically here, but you're going to use phasers all the time in circuits two. All right. Now, if I'm, if I'm looking at this, I got to understand why is this useful? It becomes more clear why it's useful as you look at applications of it. But one thing I see here, it tells me that if I had a waveform, let's say four cosine 1000 T plus 30 degrees, I could, there, there's some key parameters here. It tells me that I've got an amplitude of four. I have a phase shift of 30 degrees and I've gotten the amplitude and the phase shift all by their own self in a complex number. Okay. And if I think about that radio example that I had earlier, right, what I was looking at was the amplitudes and I could also look at the phases. That thing called the FFT basically tells me at a particular frequency what the amplitudes and phases are. As it turns out, when I'm dealing with sine waves, I can usually get rid of the time dependence and just simply analyze what's happening to the amplitude and what's happening to the frequency or sorry, what's happening to the amplitude and what's happening to the frequency, all right? If you've taken circuits two already, you should know that, right? When I put a voltage into a circuit, right? And, I, and that voltage is sinusoidal, what happens is its amplitude can change and its phase can change. And that allows us to incredibly simplify the math and get rid of all of our differential equations. So differential equations become really kind of useless in a lot of ways, okay? So that's something we gotta, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about a lot more, right? For today, you know, all we really care about is I've defined this thing called this dynamic phaser and I've defined this thing called a static phaser, okay? The static phaser is basically this thing out here in the front, which is sometimes just called the phaser, all right? The fact that I say it's dynamic means what? What's the word dynamic mean? Well, it means it's constantly changing. It's constantly changing, yeah, that's, that's right. All right, so we, we, can, we can express it, you know, in that, in that context, right? We say that this, this thing here is a complex number. This whole thing is some complex number that is always changing. Now, one thing, you know, again, if I, if I use this expression that I wrote out here, so if I consider theta to be omega t plus phi, right, then it looks to me like I could also say 4e to the j theta, plus four e to the minus j theta, right? We talked about that a little bit before. If I have e to the j theta plus e to the minus j theta, and I take that whole thing and divide it by two, what do we say that's equal to? I might have to that go would back. Be cosine theta? Oh uh, no, four, the fours aren't part of it before, but uh, I guess you divide out two, yeah, two, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Two so that's, that's right. So this guy is going to become, and I, and I should, I should really be careful about this. Uh, so it's going to be, well, let's see, it's going to become two cosine theta like that. Okay. All right. Um, which, 
Is, is it two or is it four? Well, yeah, I thought it would be what four. I, what I wrote right there is definitely going to be two, right? Um, I know where you guys are going with this, right? Two omega T plus phi. That means that I should have, if I wanted to have this to be four, which is what I do want, what should I have here? Not four, but what? Well, but if you factor out a four from all that, then it's four times the thing that we earlier said equals cosine theta. No. Right. What is what does this have to be here? Right? This has to be eight. Right. If you look at if you look at what I have back here, right. I have to have. You you got to think about this for a second, right? I have to multiply this. If I want this to be four here, I'd have to multiply. So this this guy here would have to be eights on the top there to make that work, right? So you guys, you guys can play with that later offline, right? But, but essentially what I see is that these terms here are gonna have to be, be bigger um, to be able to make that, make that work, all right? So the, the critical thing there is I'm making use of this idea of the one half, and actually, um, okay. Let me let me let me do this right. That means that these are. Oh boy, should have thought about this before I did. So now, basically, all, so let's see. Let that. Let's do it this way. Okay. What I wrote here is correct. Right. E to the j theta over two plus e to the minus j theta over two is equal to cosine theta. So if I wanted to get this to be equal to four, I got to multiply both sides by four because that's just the way algebra works, right? multiply a four on both sides like that. All right, that's probably the easiest way to look at it. All right, we're gonna have, we're gonna have some meaning to that later, but that basically means that I get two e to the j theta plus two times e to the minus j theta. All right, weird, weird thought for a second, but it's, it's one that we're gonna utilize here, all right, in a, in a second. All right, I got two ways to represent this guy, all right? One is as the real part of something, and one is as the, the combination, the additive combination of two complex exponentials. So this guy is down here, right? This is the additive combination, and this guy over here is as the real part of some individual complex number. So we're gonna play with that a little bit, all right? Um, and I wanna go through a specific example here. So. In this case, I've, I've simplified it. I've taken out the 30 degrees, right? So I just have four cosine 1000 T, which is either the real part of this or it's equal to this, all right? And again, we, you could go through what we just did here, right? And you would, you would get that result. So, if I, so in this case, I have 30 degrees. If I had made it zero degrees, then this would be E to the J zero. What's E to the J zero? One. One, that's right. So if you look at that, looks like that's what I've got here, right? Is I've got four times e to the j zero or four times one, right? Times four e to the j 1000 t equals this guy, all right? So what I see from this, for this particular waveform, the static phasor that I'm gonna have is just simply four, all right? So the amplitude of this thing is four, there is no phase shift, okay? We're gonna deal with that concept a lot here in the, in, the, in the homework, okay? All right, what I'm trying to do here is I want to visualize this thing right here as time advances. And what I actually am plotting ultimately is three different vectors, okay? One vector is going to be the sum. So essentially, I'm going to, my plot is going to be 2e to the j 1000t. That's going to be one of the things I plot. I'm also going to plot 2e to the minus j 1000t. Okay. I'm going to plot both of those and I'm going to plot their sum. All right. So I'm just, and I, and I just, I plot this, I just take the two of them and add them together. So if I take these two things and add them together, 
we're going to see that their results should become real. All right. We, we already derived that, but we're going to see it as well. Okay. So first of all, let's, let's think about this. This is at T equal to zero. So if I plug in T equal to zero, right? E to the J zero becomes one and E to the minus J zero becomes one. And so what I have, the sum of these is a vector here on the real axis that is a length of four, okay? The real part of this guy is equal to four. That's what, the, what, what this is telling me. This is the real part of the sum. This is the imaginary part of the sum. The imaginary part of the sum is zero. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let time advance a little bit. I'm gonna let time advance until I get to 30 degrees, all right? So, let, let me ask you, here's, here's, a, here's a sine wave question for us here. At what time is the angle going to equal 30 degrees? So at what time is theta going to equal 30 degrees for this waveform? What time will that happen? How do I figure that out? Thirty divided by a thousand? Yep. Yeah, basically I have that a theta was equal to omega t, right? So that means that this happens at t equal to 30 degrees divided by a thousand, right? So if you do your math on that, that basically works out to 30 milliseconds, okay? So here I am at t equal to 30 milliseconds, right? And I said I was plotting two, three vectors here, all right? So 2e to the j 30, where is that vector? Where's 2e to the j30? It's the, uh, the upper arrow on the block above. Okay, how do you, so how do you know that it's this one? What, why do we know that it's this one? Where, where does that guy have to be sitting? What angle does he have to be sitting at? 30 degrees. 30 degrees, 30 degrees right? And, and so and, and his length is two. And if you look at this, you can see his length is pretty much about, about two, right? If you, if you sit down and, and, and look at this guy closely, right? Um, if I look at, where is this guy? 2e to the minus j30, where would that sit? Opposite the x-axis, yep. so the lower one. Yeah, this one here. So this guy is there, and this guy is here. So if you think about it, these two guys are symmetric about the x-axis, right? And so just think about it right now, right? The, the top guy has an imaginary part that points up the bottom one has an imaginary part that points down by the same amount. So what should they be equal to? Zero? Well, if you add them to well, the imaginary parts will equal zero, which means that if I add this complex number to this complex number, the result should be entirely real. All right? All right? They should be equal to, they should be entirely real. All right? So what I've shown here is that at uh, 30 degrees or pi over six radians, right? What I've shown is that this value right here is four cosine 30 degrees. This is the real part of this sum, right? The imaginary part of the sum is zero. Now what's going to happen when I go to 60 degrees? What should happen then? Well, I'll be at 60 milliseconds. So at that, at t equal to 60 milliseconds, I'll be at 60 degrees. What should, what should happen to the vectors then? The same, so the same thing, except now they're gonna be at 60 degrees, right? So I have two e to the j 60 up here, right? And I have two e to the minus j 60 down here. And their sum is this guy. Now their sum is it'll smaller. Be the same. What's that? Wouldn't their sum still be the same as before? It's just, it'll be smaller in comparison to the other two lines. Well, so that what is, so think about their sum, right? I have one, I have one number pointing upward. I have one pointing downward, right? So what's happening? So when I add complex numbers, I add their real parts and I add their imaginary parts, right? The imaginary parts of two e to the j sixty and two e to the minus j sixty, those imaginary parts must be the same length, right? Oh, right. And and essentially, so they're, they're the same length, and, and so they, but they're in opposite directions, so what do they do? Well, the imaginary parts again cancel, leaving you with just four because of the real component, just like before. But now the, um, 
because we had a larger angle, the lines themselves are longer compared to the real portion. The, yeah, so, so essentially um, the real parts should be, yeah, I think <laughs> I'm gonna need to update my notes. I'm gonna, I think I blew it here. It should, the, the, the length of it should be a little bit longer. All right, now it, it's not gonna quite be, be four. And the, the reason I know it's not gonna be four, right, is because remember I have two e to the j 60 degrees is actually two times cosine. Yeah, you have uh, to take into account the cosine of 60 degrees. Yep. It's two cosine 60 degrees plus two cosine 60 degrees. Right. And then you have the, the imaginary parts canceling each other. Right. So they don't quite double. Right. But they're, they're, they should actually be a little bit longer than I, than I showed in that picture right here. It should be a little bit longer, but, but not, not a whole lot longer. All right. Um, so there, but there, they, would be, they would be less than two, right? Because two times cosine 60, if you remember what cosine 60 is, cosine 60 is a half. Actually, maybe I did do that right. Plus two times, I did do that right. So okay. that's equal to one plus one or two. Okay. Follow that? Yep. Okay. So what happens when I get to at 90 degrees? Well, I mean, following the logic we've been doing, wouldn't it just be zero for the yep. real component? Because a hundred percent of the. Of yep. That's, that's totally right. Right. So I've, there's my two vectors, right? One pointing up, one pointing down. Right. So at this point, there's no imaginary part, right? So what I'm showing on the bottom here is the imaginary part always stays zero, right? The real parts cancel each other here, right? And the real part now is zero, right? Because I'm at four cosine of 90 degrees. All right. Um, so now there is no real part to, to any of this, right? The imaginary, the imaginary part always cancels, right? And there's no real part to this. So let's say Let's say I get to the point where I want to look at um, 270 degrees. So where's 270 degrees? Uh, it's the same as negative 90 degrees. So it's the straight down. Yeah, straight down, right? So my next one here. All right, there's 270 degrees. Now here's the question for you. So this, so here's the sum of the two vectors, right? So I've got one vector and another vector. So where's e to the j 270 degrees in this case? And where's e to the minus j 270 degrees? Which one is which? They flip, right? They flipped, yeah, they right? This guy's on the bottom. This guy's on the top now, right? But if we, if we look at it, I mean, essentially what I can see is that the pattern that I have expected is always there. The, the key thing is that if I, if I utilize all the way back to what we derived here at the very beginning, right, is essentially, is essentially what it's saying is if I take e to the j theta and e to the j negative theta and add them together, what I get is something that's purely real and traces out cosine, right? That's what's happening here, right? I'm getting something, so I've got two vectors and I'm showing the sum of those two vectors. Here it is at 30 degrees, right? Their sum is right here, right? I can see this very graphically now, right? So this is, this is their sum. And here's the real part of their sum. Here's the imaginary part of their sum. As time advances, I see that what happens here is I just, I'm purely getting a vector that's moving, the sum of them is a vector that moves along the real axis like this, all right? <clears throat> and I can keep going with it, all right? All right, so here I am at 360 degrees. By 360 degrees, they've gone all the way back to the beginning, all right? And I got a little MATLAB script that basically plays this as a movie that I'll upload so you guys can basically watch it and, and make some sense of it, okay? Let's say instead that I had this guy here, four sine 1000 T, okay? Now four sine 1000 T would be the imaginary part of e to the j 1000 t, right? So remember if I have e to the j 1000 t, that's equal to the real part, well, sorry, that's equal to cosine 1000 t, that's its real part, plus j sine 1000 t, 
right? So the imaginary part is just that, okay? So, so one thing to do anytime I'm asking you these questions is probably just to write out the, the Euler's identity and then see how the imaginary and the, and the real part kind of combine with each other. All right, now, what I did was I also said, well, I wanna use, I wanna use uh, this relationship now, all right? To convert between essentially e to the j theta and e to the minus j theta between these two complex numbers, I wanna relate them to sine, okay? So what I did was I wrote out that same expression here. So let's get to that slide, okay? So notice what I did, I did two over j, e to the j 1000t minus two over j, e to the minus j 1000t. And I've got those at t equal to zero, I've got those two vectors and their sum plotted here, okay? So let's think about this. So I plugged in at t equal to 1000, right? So at t equal to 1000, I get, so I have two over j times e to the j 1000 times zero minus two over j e to the negative j 1000 times zero, like that. So that becomes simply two over j times e to the j zero minus two over j e to the minus j zero. All right, now I want you guys to help me. I wanna draw this vector and I wanna draw this vector. What angle is two over j times e to the j zero? How would I figure that out? How would I figure that out? The angle of two over j times e to the j zero. Well, if it's, well, if it's at uh, zero degrees, then shouldn't the angle be at zero degrees? If it's just e to the j zero, but I have two over j times e to the j zero, okay? Is it like just a vertical line, I would assume? It, it is a vertical With... line, yeah, it is. So how would I figure that out? So what I have here, the thing to remember is I've got two complex numbers multiplying each other actually, two over J and E to the J zero are two separate complex numbers, right? So two over J, let's convert that guy to complex exponential or polar form, right? How would I do that? What's the magnitude of two over J? I know right now that it's two, all right? What angle does that thing have? Let me ask you this. So let's do it this what way. I got two on top. What about on the bottom? What's the, how could I express J? How could I write that guy? What does J have to be? It's a number that has no real part, right? So doesn't it look like it should be zero plus J? That's true, right? So question I ask myself is I have, if I have J like that, what angle does J have to have? Oh, it wouldn't have to have like 90 degrees? 90 degrees, right? Because it's the same as two over cosine 90 plus J sine 90, right? Cosine of 90 is what? Zero. Sine of 90 is one, okay? You guys follow that? Yep. Yes. Okay. It's two to the J, or two times E to the negative J 90. Yes, you see, all right, yeah, you went right to the next step, right? So if I have two over J, that means that I have two over E to the J 90, which becomes two E to the minus J 90, like that. Okay, you guys follow that? Yep. Okay. All right. That means then that if I have, so two over J times E to the J zero, that becomes two over J E to the J zero degrees becomes two E to the minus J 90 degrees times E to the J zero degrees. So I said, if I take a number that has an angle of zero and I multiply it by something that has an angle of negative 90, where does it go? Doesn't it go to negative 90? It goes to negative 90, right? It do a rotation. So e to the j zero times two over j is there. And this guy 
is here. Okay. Now, why did I know that one was there? Well, I have two over J again. Two over J has an angle of negative 90. What is minus one always equal to? This guy here is actually this top, this minus two J or minus two over J times E to the J zero is basically minus one times two E to the J negative 90, right? times e to the j zero degrees. There's three numbers multiplied there. What angle is minus one? 180. 180, right? So I have 180 minus 90 is 90, okay? So that takes something at zero degrees and rotates it to 90 degrees, okay? You guys follow that? <clears throat> I wanted to go yeah. through this. I wanted to go through this because it's important to understand how to, how to do all these relationships, okay? So now if, if I go to, let's see, what do you think is gonna happen when I get to T, I advance time to 30 milliseconds, right? So I'm at 30 degrees. What should happen then? Well, we know those two vectors are gonna have moved, right? First of all, which direction are the vectors gonna have moved? Well, they're gonna have moved like that, right? So in this case, what I have is the bottom vector is gonna move, this bottom vector here is gonna move forward, right? Because it's got a positive sign here. This guy's got a negative sign, so he's gonna move in the clockwise direction. And that's exactly what happens, okay? You go through this and you get the, the same exact result. Now notice what's happening. When I add these two together, I'm still tracing out just a real thing, right? So as I go from here, their summation is zero. Here, their summation is still on the real axis. Here, it's on the real axis, but bigger at 60 degrees. And then at 90 degrees, they add up together, all right? What's, what do you notice about the real part in this case? So the real part of the sum starts at zero, then it gets a little bit bigger, and it gets a little bit bigger at 60 degrees. And then at 90 degrees, it, it, it has a maximum. What am I tracing out with the real part now? A, a sine, sine wave. wave. A sine wave, exactly what I would expect it to be, right? That's what the math, what the derivation sort of told us it, it was. By the time I get to 270 degrees, there it is, right? And so if I kept going, it would, it would continue along those lines, right? So it's, I, to me, it's important to understand all those, all those visualizations, right? Because this guy is, is really, really important. All right, <clears throat> so a couple of terms we've already thrown out there that I wanna kind of finalize with here as we come up in the last couple of minutes, right? Is this, um, this idea, we're gonna use this a lot in circuits too. They talk about it in the textbook, this concept of phasers, and I've already kind of thrown it out there. But if I have a waveform that exists in the real world, like that radio wave that I have earlier, right? Which A cosine omega T plus phi. I can represent this thing as the real part of A e to the J omega T times E to the J phi, right? Where I have the standard definition that A is the amplitude, omega is the angular frequency, and phi is the um, phase shift, all right? So this thing here, right? I, I said there were two terms in this guy right? A times E to the J phi is defined as the, the phaser, the static phaser. The whole thing is defined as this sort of dynamic phaser, right? This thing that moves over time, okay? So um, what I want to do then is say, okay, well, let's go back to what I started with at the beginning, right? If I had four cosine 1000 T plus 30 degrees, and I wanna write that in that form. So that's gotta be the real part of something. So how do I write that? So real part of what? And if I don't remember, I can always say, well, I know that four e to the j theta equals what? Four e to the j theta has to be what, always? four times what plus J times four what? Cosine theta, sine theta. Yep, cosine theta, sine theta, right? 
So that means that this guy has to be the real part of what? Four times what? Remember my theta is omega t plus phi. So how do I write this here? The real part of four times what? E to the 1000. E to the 1000 T, right? And I'm gonna write the, I'm gonna write the E to the J 30 first, like that. Okay. All right. Now, what, I, what I'm doing is now what I wanna do is I'm gonna say, okay, well, I wanna show what this is, right? I wanna show what that is. So what I've got actually here is, uh, and plotted, plotted here is a T equal to zero. All right, I've shown the same, I'm showing two things here. I'm showing this whole vector here, all right? This whole vector is basically, well, the whole vector is actually right here, sorry. The whole vector at t equal to zero is right there, right? How do I know the full vector at time t equal to zero is pointing up like that? At t equal to zero, where does that, what is the angle of this, of this whole vector? We have the, uh, 30 the degrees. 30, 30 degrees. degrees, right? He's up at 30 degrees. What have I shown here? Uh, we've shown that there's a 30 degree phase shift on the original. Uh, maybe I'm missing something. Well, so this, what, what is this guy, what is this bottom thing right here? Well, that's just the real part of, of right. this vector right there, right? So on the bottom, I have the real part. So what I'm gonna do, now I'm gonna advance this guy to t equal to 30 degrees, all right? So at t equal to 30 degrees, right? Or the, the time that corresponds to 30 degrees is 30 milliseconds, right? At that point in time, what I have is that this guy is equal to four cosine 30 degrees plus 30 degrees or four cosine 60 degrees, okay? So for cosine 60 degrees, let's think about that for a second. What's the cosine of 60? One half. One half, right? That's equal to two, all right? If I look at the real part, all right? So here, this guy right here, this is four e to the j 30 degrees times e to the j 1000 times 0 0.03, right? This is, this, is the, this is the dynamic phaser at that point. This guy is the four e to the j 30, right? The dynamic phase or the static phaser. He's not moving, all right? He's not moving. This part here is the real part, right? What's the real part equal to? Two, exactly like what we said. So if I let this thing keep moving, right? Here I am at essentially 60 degrees. And now I see that this guy is pointing upwards, which is if you do the math here, that's exactly what should happen. And here I am um, now at 90 degrees. This guy is now pointing at 120, 30 degrees farther ahead, right? Here's the real part, okay? And I see that that real part is negative. You go through and you do the math, you'll see that's exactly what you would expect. And then this guy over here is that static phase or the part that's not moving. Right, and I can keep following this through and I notice that what I trace out with the real part is exactly what I would expect for cosine 1000 T plus 30 degrees. All right, I have, I'm gonna share with you the MATLAB script that I use to make these so you can kind of play around with it yourself and kind of understand it a little bit um, as you go through it and then I'll post these notes as well. All right, so we're basically at time for today. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it there um, we'll talk about this a little bit more on, on Tuesday as well. All right. And I, like I said, I can stick around here probably for a good 20 or 30 minutes if you guys have some additional questions. Um, and you can feel free to ask any questions that you want. 